Can you hear me? Yeah, it works. Now it works, okay. How much time do you give me? Or give us? 45 minutes or something at least? You have, you have, uh, you have 30. 30 minutes, that's all. This will be the shortest speech I ever gave. And it's gonna be interactive too? I have 45 minutes, okay. We have 45 minutes, okay, let's get started. So, um, uh, I, was, I was one of those kids who went to a library when I was a kid, like Caddy said before, when I was a kid and I was like six, seven years old and I, I started reading early and when I was like seven years old I read Kant and I read Hume and I read Nietzsche and I read all these guys with these great beards and I wanted to be one of them, I wanted to be a philosopher. And I got what they were writing and I thought, okay, if I get what they're writing I can be a philosopher one day, except the problem is that philosophy is an art and not a science. And if you're an artist, you know that if you copy something, it's absolutely useless. So you have to create something original. And the problem was that these guys had pretty much said everything. <laughs> so, you know, if you're just going to quote philosophers, you end up being a teacher of philosophy, which is pretty useless. It's like being a teacher of art instead of being an artist, right? You want to be an artist. So I thought, okay, okay. Maybe I live in one of those ages when philosophy can't really say anything. So I'm just going to be one of these guys who quotes Kant and Hegel and Nietzsche all the time. Because we live, you know, there's so much going on at the moment that this is not a golden age of philosophy. They might come in the future. But I happen to be one of these guys who happens to live exactly during those 70 years when nothing really happens. <laughs> like the Dark Ages or something like that. So I pretty much accepted that. And, and I, I was going into other arts, like video art, performance art. I was doing theater in my teens. And uh, then eventually I decided to study economics, you know, and I uh, went to the Stockholm School of Economics in the 1980s. And uh, after having done economics, I discovered that I could do some songwriting. Uh, I, I discovered that by accident, by the way. I was 23 years old. I had absolutely no idea how to read notes. I couldn't play an instrument, so I couldn't sing. And I decided to make that an advantage, <laughs> which made me the world's first 100% electronic computerized record producer. And this turned out to be exactly the right timing for being a record producer. So this was the 1980s, the synthesizer had arrived, the sequence had arrived, the studio was coming, uh, computerized, and I just happened to be this obnoxious new young music producer who wanted to do house music instead of old rock records, and I loved electronics instead of regular instruments, and I hated musicians, and I always have, and I'm proud of it. Because they're usually men and they're full of, you know, they, they just want to play guitar like if they were jerking off all the time. So the, the second you invite the guitar player to your studio, he wants to put guitars on everything. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm the record producer, I'm the songwriter, I decide we're going to put on this record, and I hate musicians because they want to put their instruments on absolutely everything, e even if it makes it worse. So I, I discovered that I could actually, by not reading notes and not being a musician, I could take ideas from my brain how to make music, put them into a computer and make wonderful records that people would dance to. And, and, you know, reviewers hated my records, but the fans loved them and bought them and I made a fortune. Okay. <laughs> Enough said. Jump to 1998, and by this time I'm pretty established. The Cardigans are number one in America, and I've got all these records everywhere, and I'm making a lot of money. And, and, uh, and then this one day, a guy from the Stockholm School of Economics comes in through the door, and he happens to be on the board of my record company. He says, why are you sitting here, Alexander? Why are you being the boss of 30 people at your record company? You hate this. Yeah, I do. I do. What am I doing here? You're doing nine to five, Alexander. I'm doing nine to five. Oh my God, it's so horrible. What was your boyhood dream? Oh, I wanted to be a philosopher, but philosopher is nothing to say in our time. And his name is Shell Nordstrom. And you know, he's one of these guys who's so sexy and hunky, he looks like he's one of those stars from the Matrix movie or something. You know, the kind of guy that all guys want to be and that all women want to sleep with. You know? So he, he can go around the world and charge huge fortunes for giving speeches on things he's never done. <laughs> Management theorist, that kind of guy. So Shell comes in through the door and he says, Alexander, why don't you become a philosopher? And I said, because there's nothing to say. Okay. We have the Stockholm School of Economics, and we have the higher education at Stockholm School of Economics, and we do research there, and we throw people, we throw money at people who can do fun things and interesting things that nobody else does. And we have our students who've done the economics business thing, they've done their careers in finance and business, they come back 10 years later, they go through the higher education, and we give them a sheet and ask them, what was it you never learned at school 
that you really should have known about. And the number one thing they put there is the internet. Because nobody knows what this fucking thing is all about. <laughs> and I get the idea. This is my chance to be a philosopher. Because <laughs> Nietzsche and Kant and Hume never had the internet. <laughs> yeah. So I decided to go back and reread Marx, Nietzsche, Hume, Kant, all those heroes, and a few women in there too, I agree. Hannah Arendt, and especially now when there's this whole new field of female philosophers that I love, by the way. Finally, the female voice is heard in the world of philosophy too. But anyway, I'm rereading all these guys and discovering I can actually use these guys and reread them and then write as if they saw the internet coming. So the year 2000, two years later, after I sold the record company, I did sell it the year before Napster arrived. <laughs> I'm, I'm very proud of being a fat rat jumping off the ship when it's time to jump off the ship. That's exactly why I'm the only music industry executive in Europe who joined the pirate party. Because I like to be with the winners. And I don't think it's a very good idea to throw lawyers at teenagers and millions. OK? Stupid people. Yeah. So I like to be with the times. And when you see something happening, why not go with it? So I wrote my first book with John Sedekvist two years later, 2000. It's called The Netocrats, and it became a worldwide success. And the only reason why it became a success was simply because we took Karl Marx, we took his class analysis from the 1840s, and applied it on the internet. And said, what would Karl Marx have said about the internet? Well, the number one thing he would have said is that anything I said in 1840 is now becoming irrelevant. Because something far more powerful than the old industrial capitalist individualist society we lived in is now materializing. And this has a class structure to it. And you probably know what I'm talking about because in the year 2015, I don't think we can hide this any longer because there is a difference in power and influence between somebody who has 40,000 Twitter followers and somebody who's 14. Somebody who has 5,000 Facebook friends and somebody has 11 out of which 10 were neighbors they forced to become friends. We don't want to talk about this stuff. We're very uncomfortable about this. But we, we still use the old models to understand in contemporary society, when if we really want to understand contemporary society, both to nurture it, both to gain from it, both to use it, but also to sort of help the people out there who are helpless right now, we need new models to understand this shit. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. Stone, bronze, iron. Three prefixes. What would you say that after that? Ages. ages. OK, clever, clever students. There we go. First interactive moment here today. <laughs> They're ages. OK, quick question. Do you believe that Stone Age people were aware of the fact that they lived during the Stone Age? No. no. Was there even a Stone Age? No. It's made up. It's called storytelling. So the interesting question here is if you Google history is when did the term stone age, this is philosophy, terminology, when did the term stone age first occur? If you Google it. They all occurred at the same time. Guess where and when? Not far from here. In Germany, of course, in the 1850s. They were all invented. Maybe then. The term Stone Age says a lot more about Germany in the 1850s than it says about people during the Stone Age. Because the Flintstone family never existed. They were made up by Disney or something. Yeah? So we go to Germany in the 1850s, and then we look at this. Why would you divide history into these ages? Well, they're all physical materials that we tame. So the idea here is that in the beginning there was a Stone Age, there was a stone guy, he made stone things, and he thought stone was really, really cool. So he would do all these stony things, and then the bronze guy came along and said, stone is nothing, ooh, let's do bronze. I get laid because I do bronze, because I'm the cool guy, because now it's the bronze age. We're all gonna do bronze from now on and forget about stone, ridiculous shit, out it goes. <laughs> And then Iron Guy comes along and says, well, bronze is for the elite. You do great sculptures, and you can do Dionysus and all that. But I'm doing iron, and with iron, we can really change the world, because with iron, we can do things affordably to loads of people. So now it's the Iron Age, and I'm the guy you all want to sleep with. And then it goes on and on and on, until eventually you arrive in Germany in the 1850s, and somebody builds a factory. The whole point here was 
that we always redesign history to suit the now. And that's clever. That's the only thing we can do. We do it ourselves all the time. When you define who you are today, you define the person sitting here having a dialogue with me right now. And then you sort of have this idea that a long time ago you were in a womb, and that was pretty nice, and it was like a morphine tent, you were there for nine months, and then you were kicked out and it was all horrible. Yeah, Freud told you that, right? You don't even remember your own birth because it's so fucking horrible you don't want to even talk about it. <laughs> Mothers going through birth, nothing compared to what the kid goes through. <laughs> nothing. Freud was right. I can't remember my birth either. So you get out there, and there's this old lady, and she cuts it off and all that, and suddenly you're alone, and you're no longer in the womb, and suddenly there's this gaping hole there called the eye, the ego. You know, you're supposed to be something suddenly. So from that moment on, until now, you have this idea that this is a life history, right, a timeline, that's you. Now, we do the same thing with the social. We do the same, same thing with society. Every nation state has a sort of made up history about itself. That it began somewhere there and then suddenly it's now here. And that in, this timeline is our history and that history is an identity. And from that identity we build a model and with that model we understand the world. And we take that model to look into the future. That means if we use the wrong model, we get it wrong. If we use the right model, we get it right. And the problem with us human beings is that we always tend to use old models, because we were taught we should use these old models. We had a Swedish minister of education called Jan Björklund, who thinks that Prussia in the 1870s is a good model for Sweden in the future. So we should teach the kids these things today too. I strongly disagree. <laughs> I don't think... I don't think the taming of physical materials now is relevant. Where are these factories now? Well, the factory owners pay the historians to write a certain type of history in the 50s, when, of course, the factory owner should be at the center of things. Because historians are these jerks who don't make a lot of money, so they will always write a history that says that whoever pays my bills is the center of things. But that's clever. What we need to do, though, is to redo the whole process. Skip these things and look at our age today. And then we discover three other prefixes. And I know these are cliches, but you know what? Philosophers love cliches because cliches are popular because they're probably true. So we have these three cliches. They're information and communication and network. Ages, right? Well, they're all the same age. They're our age. My point here is this. What people did in Germany in the 1850s when industrialism, individualism, and capitalism exploded to understand themselves, to do their own storytelling, was to rewrite history through the reflection of the taming of physical materials, which is what industry is all about. Why don't we do the same thing now? Then the move we need to do philosophically is to say that all ages have been information ages. Now, can, can we apply that on history empirically? Yes, we can. Because we human beings have four different ways of communicating with each other. I know, if, if, ladies, if you look at a guy standing in a bar on a Friday night here in Lance Corona being very drunk, he's pretty much an ape. That's an ape. We all know that. Now, if he can at least speak one word, he's no longer an ape. He becomes a human being, sociologically speaking. That means, biologically speaking, human beings have existed for seven million years. Seven million years ago, the apes threw humans out of the jungle because they thought we were ugly and to put us on the savannah said, you can sleep with each other, we're not going to sleep with you anymore because you're so fucking ugly. You don't have anything to do with you. And we were suddenly left on our own on the savannah. So seven million years ago, biologically we became humans, sociologically we've only been humans for about 100,000 years. Because that's pretty much how long we've talked. Speech. First paradigm, instead of stone. Let's start there. Speech, okay? We've talked for about 100,000 years. I can say onk onk and onk ink, and they mean totally different things symbolically. And the great thing with that is that if I see a lion here, and the lion's going to kill my friend over there on the other side of the hill, I can shout, a lion is coming, kill it. And he can kill the lion. Oh, he's a lot weaker than the lion. Because together, him and I become more clever than the lions are. 
Now we can become top of the heap. That works pretty well, but we're still nomads. We're walking around, hunting, gathering, trying to find food all the time. And these different nomadic tribes are killing each other all the time. Because the struggle to find food is a struggle for survival. Nomadic society never had more than 3 million inhabitants on the entire planet. As long as we're just looking for food all the time and we're not producing it, we cannot inhabit more than 3 million on this planet. That's it. Then something happens in southern Iraq, ironically, 5,000 years ago. What is that? Writing. Good kids, good students. Writing arrives. Why is writing so important? Well, the thing is this. If you were a nomadic tribe and you were walking around all the time trying to find food, where are the fucking strawberries? Where are the pigs? Where can we have something to eat? You know, In that type of a society, where do you find the maximum amount of information and knowledge? Elders. Elders inside the head of an old woman. If a kid dies, you wouldn't care less. Oh, it's just a kid. We can have another one. They died all the time. The kids just died at night. Women would, on average, have 27 children during the lifetime during the nomadic age. I know it sounds horrible, but you're modern people now. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You're not there now. You wouldn't have known better anyway. <laughs> you wouldn't have known about the internet, you know? So anyway, but you know, if an older, elderly woman died, that would be disaster, huge funeral. Because with her, would that information die? What she had learned during her life would be lost. So it was impossible to build on other people's experiences. You would have to relearn the same thing all the time. Nothing ever developed. Everything was equally stupid all the time, and this lasted for like 100,000 years until writing arrived. What do you do when you have writing? You have paper and you have pen. OK, old woman is dying. No problem, I fix it. I go to old woman, I said, OK, Mrs. Old Woman, which mushroom is healthy to eat? Which, mus which mushroom is really nice to eat? Which mushroom is poisonous? Which mushroom can I kill my girlfriend with if she's unfaithful to me? Which mushroom is fun? You know, I, I can find out everything about mushrooms by interviewing her. So what happens is that I interview the old woman, I get all the information out of her head, down on a piece of paper. She dies, and they'll go, oh, old woman has died. No, don't worry about it. We can just give her a tiny funeral somewhere in the corner, because I have managed to extract all the information out of her head and put it on this documentation. Now, civilization kicks in. Because now we can accumulate information, and we do not have to repeat old mistakes. And what would be the dream for the nomadic tribe in that sense? We can settle down in one of the same place, eat hamburgers and go fat and never have to move around any longer. That's exactly what we do. We create permanent settlements. With the permanent settlements, we create new storytelling. I don't no longer desire to kill the guys from the other tribe. I have to try to learn to collaborate to, with them, even if I hate their guts. Okay? Because I don't have time, actually, to go and kill them all the time. There's no point to it. We should actually try to collaborate. You're further down the river. I've got another tribe further up the river. Why don't we try to trade with each other, only worse now and then? Then you need a common storytelling. You can no longer have your own Ur father and Ur mother for your tribe. Tell this to the Jews. They're still stuck there. We have to have one God for all of us. Universal God arrives, monotheism arrives, etc. So we built a whole damn paradigm on writing. And the amount of information available to us has exploded a million times over. Then comes another paradigm. Here's a book, the latest book I wrote. It, it's on Burning Man, by the way, in participatory culture, if you want to read it. And it's nonprofit, so I can actually wave it around. It's not self promotion, okay? So anyway, this is a book. In 1449, if I would make a book, what would I do? This is before the printing press arrives. Somebody has to write it by hand. I would go to monastery and I would probably find a snobbish monk. And he would tell me, oh, you can take one of those tickets and wait for me for three hours and then I will look into your book. And then he comes up and looks at the book and says, oh, this is Bards and Subject with new book. Oh, that's a fancy book. Very pretentious, very difficult. It's gonna take me at least a year to write a copy of this book. And by the way, I'm terribly busy. So you can come back two years from now. I will get you one more copy of the book you can give to Johanna if you like, and it will cost you 150,000 euros. 
That was the average cost of producing a book in 1449. Then the printing press arrives. Gutenberg, Germany. The arrival of mass media. The third paradigm. Why is that different? Because the cost of producing a book now falls dramatically. Europe is full of monks and nuns demonstrating the next 100 years. Stop the fucking printing press, it's killing our jobs. <laughs> oh, they're not so snobbish anymore now, are they? Huh? This is the interesting thing. What was the metaphysics here? Monophysitic religion. This is interesting. In 1450, when the printing press arrives, Gutenberg is a good Catholic. He was actually interviewed. And he was asked about the Bible. And he said, well, the beautiful thing with the printing press, you see, is that now we can translate the Bible from old, horrible Greek and Hebrew into contemporary local dialects around Europe. And we can call them German and Danish and Norwegian and Swedish and French and English. And people can actually read this fantastic book and become really good Christians. And the Catholic Church cheered and said, yes, this is wonderful. Now we can all become good Christians. And the Bible was translated, and the Bible was printed in the printing press, and people started reading it. So far, so good, Mr. Gutenberg. Then we'll discover what a shitty book it was. <laughs> what is this? The Bible. This is about kings who tear kids apart in deserts. This has nothing to do with me whatsoever. I'm living in a village in Europe, and gradually we're now you know, becoming so civilized, we can, we can turn farming industrial, so we can move into cities, where we can start building factories, where we can read and write and count, so we can do factory work. So what the fuck is the Bible doing here? The Catholic Church discovered, this is just like the dot-com companies in the 1990s. The dot-com companies were essentially old industrials believing the internet was for them. It was the easiest thing in the world to kill the dot-com ideas. Because the first thing the internet will do is, of course, slaughter the old models. Have you got a travel agency next door to you these days? No, you don't. You laugh at it, right? A record company? Why? Why would you have CDs? My mother is 80 years old. She's got Spotify. She threw away her CDs so she could get stuffed African pets instead. Because they're more interested to look at the fucking CDs. Only Germans buy CDs, the conservative shitholes. So, well, it was their paradigm, wasn't it, right? The only guys buying CDs today are Germans. They're also the only people paying in cash. <laughs> Terribly conservative. Oh, they, I charge them heavily when I give speeches to them. I should. Yeah. So, what happens here is that in 1517, the Catholic Church had discovered that the printing press was their biggest enemy. And they actually managed through lobbying to introduce the death penalty for the use of printing presses in France. Exactly like right record companies throwing lawyers at teenagers in the 2000s. Did record companies win? No, they disappeared. The Catholic Church, it's a few poles and an old lady left. <laughs> Nobody else cares. Because we got the Enlightenment philosophers in France and Germany about 100 years later, and they told us about a new idea of the world that gave us a new metaphysics, a new religion called individualism. So individualism arrives here, and individualism and paper money coming out of the printing press creates the conditions for capitalism. And we have a new paradigm. Now, this is the problem. This is the paradigm that's stuck in our heads. And it's no longer working. When did this paradigm really peak? It peaked if I say Paris, 1789, what do you say then? Paris, 1789, what happened? Yeah, you've all learned at school that the French Revolution happened. Okay, what if I say the French Revolution was not a revolution at all, it was a symptom of a revolution. The real revolution had already happened in 1415 Germany. The reason why the French Revolution happened was because Paris had become the first city in the world where over half the population could read and write. The tabloid had arrived, the encyclopedia had arrived, and people felt, we know a lot more than we used to. We know how to build guillotines. And we know we hate kings and queens, because they've used us for a really long time. And we hate the fucking priests around the Catholic Church, because they tried to stop us from using the printing press. Now, we hate all these guys, so we're going to chop their heads off, and we're going to be out of the streets, and we're going to kill everything, and slaughter it, and destroy it. And they did. With a vengeance. They found their own Lindsay Lowen. Her name was Marie Antoinette. 
She was Austrian, and she was a queen, and she was sitting in a castle, and she had the audacity to eat cakes instead of baguettes for breakfast. Chop her head off. Off it went. <laughs> and the world was stunned. And the young philosophers of the time, like Immanuel Kant and Hegel in Germany, they loved what they saw. There was this new power arising, like from out of nowhere. It wasn't out of nowhere at all. It was a result of a new way of communicating with each other. Mass reading. We are the byproducts of the way we communicate. That is why we think differently now from we did 2,000 or 3,000 years ago. And that is the only difference. Because genetically, we human beings are exactly the same we were 50,000 years ago. The only thing that changes over time is information technology. There was a tiny Corsican dwarf in Paris in 1789 called Napoleon. <laughs> he was one of those Indian computer developers today. <laughs> totally underrated and saw his little chance. Okay, Corsica is like the uncoolest place in France. It's like this horrible little island in the Mediterranean and they speak a really bad dialect and all the French look down on them. It's just like, oh, you're a Corsican. <laughs> and he was a dwarf too. It's like if you're a dwarf, you know your only way to have a sex life is to be a porn star. You will, never, you will never sleep with anybody else otherwise. So he was a Corsican dwarf, and he said, I'm going to use that to my advantage. Like Alexander Barr, the record producer in 1985. <laughs> I'm not an aristocrat. I'm not really French. And uh, they're underrating me. Because they're going to chop the heads off every fucking aristocrat and king and priest they can find. That means they're going to start chopping their own heads off eventually. Until somebody steps in and says, I know what's going on here, and I can control all this. Just give it to me. In the year 1800, Napoleon, through the Bomber Coupe, takes over France, because the only thing they got left to trust is a Corsican dwarf. And he organizes a new model where you put Napoleon at the top, and then you have a few officers here, and then under the officers here, you have under officers, and down here you have the cannon fodder. Okay, don't all armies look like that? No. The difference between Napoleon's army and all previous armies is that even the cannon fodder could read and write. Because Napoleon had realized there was the tabloid and the encyclopedia and the reading writing capacities that made the French Revolution possible. He understood it was only a symptom of the real revolution, which is always technological. So he taught his soldiers to read and write, and he gambled on this one hypothesis. A soldier who can read and write is going to be 100 times more efficient as a murdering machine compared to an alphabet. And he was right. His army won all of Europe. All the other powers of Europe united against Napoleon, and he killed them all and slaughtered them all. And when he finally reached Berlin to conquer Berlin, the Prussian army was twice the size of the French army. But in the Prussian army, they could only report about three kilometers back, which is like you use the biggest lung of the biggest young soldier you got, and you make him shout, Oh, French are coming! Three kilometers. Then it collapses. Napoleon's army could all read and write. He could report all the way back to Paris, all the way back to Berlin, and probably behind enemy lines. He knew exactly what was going on, and he beat the shit out of the Germans, and he tore Germany down, and he burned it down to pieces, and the Germans were convinced this is just the apocalypse. End of everything. Except the year after this happened. This was 1806. The year after, 1807, they had a super Alexander Bard in Germany, a philosopher called Hegel. He was one of those rare philosophers who actually had his break while he was still alive. He'd even made a fortune by them in 1807, unheard of in the history of philosophy. Philosophers are usually guys who only get remembered once they're dead. So Hegel wrote a miraculous book called The Phenomenology of Spirit in 1807. And in the foreword of this book, he wrote, what's, the, what's wrong with these Germans? They're just pussies. They don't get it. Napoleon is the shit. And the great thing with Napoleon, and we're Germans, is that we can copy him, and that's the only thing Germans are good at. They know how to copy things and make them industrial. And that's exactly what Napoleon, what he did. So he took Napoleon's model and built the entire new German nation state on this model. That means every institution we've known for the past 200 years was built on Napoleon's army as a model. Factories, companies, bureaucracies, governments, prisons even, police forces. And the last one of these old guys, you, you, as you recall now, they're all dying now, right? Something has happened. But anyway, the last one of these is, of course, this one. I got a sour throat. What do I do? Well, in Sweden, at least, I have to go to a fucking hospital. Okay? So I go to this fucking hospital, 
And an old lady tells me, there's an old chair over there, Alexander. You have to sit and wait on that chair for at least three hours for Napoleon to arrive. So you sit on the chair, and you've got this old magazine in front of you. And always when they tell you, you have to turn your mobile off. You can tell it's an old institution which is afraid of dying. What do you turn your mobile off? It doesn't, deter, it, it doesn't disturb any equipment in the hospital. For God's sake, hospital equipment runs on different frequencies than a mobile. It's like turning your mobile on when you enter an airplane. Why? They're just scared of it, aren't they? So you sit there and wait and discover, wait a second, all these other institutions, I've killed them already. We don't have the factories anymore. We don't have the old corporations the way they used to run. The people that ever listened to the customers, you know, old man, over 50 years old, patriarchs called. You know, they're all gone now. Why am I waiting for this guy? OK, I'm pretending I'm going to smoke. So I'm going to go outside from the hospital so I can turn on my mobile. I turn on my mobile, I download an app, and I talk to my friends. And suddenly, there's this gorgeous 23-year-old woman in Dubai talking to me. And she's a doctor with a PhD from Stanford. And she runs her own app. And she says that, you know what? I can, I can actually measure your bloodstream just by putting your mobile on, on, on your neck or whatever. But you know what's more interesting is that I've actually got the epidemiological map behind me, and it's covered with your GPS. So I know exactly which virus and bacteria are in the neighborhood of Stockholm you're located right now. So I can give you the perfect drug to treat your problem, your perfect medication. A Polish courier will drop it on your head 10 minutes from now. Leave the hospital right away. Let it die. <laughs> 10 minutes later, I've left the hospital. Napoleon comes down in his white frock. He's the doctor, Mr. Doctor. And there are no patients there. And if the patients are gone, that means the nurses won't sleep with me anymore. What the fuck is happening? Why is he still there? You see, the thing is this. We did introduce radio and television in the 20th century, and they did blind us. Because radio and television, sociologically speaking, are only enhancing Napoleon's army. That means if I taught at a management theory school until the early 1990s, this was the right model to teach. This was the right history to preach to kids at school. But this is what's so striking with the internet and why it's participatory by nature. It's not participatory because we think it's great to be participatory and do things together. It's participatory because it forces us to be participatory. This is what happens. When the internet arrives, the cannon fodder start talking to each other. And of course, first they talk about Napoleon. Napoleon's wearing a blue costume today, blue outfit. No, he's wearing a red outfit. Oh, he should wear green outfits. Why are you talking about his outfits all the time? I'm more interested in Napoleon's sex life. Is he sleeping with women or men or children or animals or what? So they talk about Napoleon and the court life of Napoleon, blah, 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 blah. And they start blogs and they start Facebook forums and they socialize. And they now spend on average six and a half hours a day using digital media. That means they now live in a digital world where the physical world is no longer very interesting. Welcome to the world of people in the 21st century. And this goes on and on and on, and the talk about Napoleon goes on until finally one of these little blogging teenage girls says, why are we talking about Napoleon? We could talk about each other. <laughs> He's dead. When I started teaching these theories about 15 years ago, most of the people I had to teach to, because they paid me for it, were men who were over 50 years old, and they were running corporations. And they hated this and said, no, no, no. Oh, you're talking about building a call center. That is terrible. If we have a call center, all these people who hate us, our customers, will start calling us, and they will go on and on and on about our terrible products that we fooled on them. OK. None of those guys are around anymore. We've killed them. They're useless. We can't employ them anymore. If you look at the average corporation today in America and Europe, it has a 60-year-old male boss called the chief technology officer. We don't need him any longer either. We now have the cloud. Then we have a 50-year-old man called the chief information officer, supposed to run all the information flows through the company. OK, he's pretty worried and scared right now. Then we have a third new boss, also reporting to the chief officer. And it's the chief digital officer who controls social media, usually a woman being 30 years old. The guys hate her, because she's going to kill them. Because women are far more socially intelligent than men are. We are now so far removed from the advantage from physical strength that it's basically something we only do in poor movies and swingers clubs. Men pretending to be male. I'm going to fuck you really hard. Yeah, it's theater. 
Fuck me then. It's just theater now. Those muscles the men have are useless because they cannot communicate. <laughs> fight club. Yeah, I get fight club. I get why men are frustrated right now because they're totally out of the game. This is useless. It's not going to be sex in the future because there's no value any longer for us. This is what happened. This is the world now, and this is over. Now, to manage to find a way through this chaos is the real challenge. And this is the terrible news. When the internet arrived, we would have all these guys running all over the place, and oh, this is a wonderful new tool, and finally we'll all be equal, and finally we'll all get a chance to do whatever we want. And in a way, it's true. Because if I'm going to develop something wonderful like a new app that loads of people want to use, I might as well sit in Kenya, or India, or Madagascar, as I would sit in Sweden, or Finland, Norway, or America. It doesn't matter. Broadband is everywhere. But we're just creating a new class structure. If you use the old models that people constantly do, what would you measure here to find social, so your social role, your social status? What would you measure in mass media society? You would do like my dad did. You would check income and wealth. OK, look at Sweden today, for example. Where would you find the person with the lowest possible income and wealth? It'd probably be a Somali cab driver in a suburb of Stockholm. OK, so the old elite will find the Somali cab driver and say, oh, poor guy, he's the underclass. He works 16 hours a day driving us around in his Uber car. Poor him. OK, so if you read daily newspapers, you know, the ones that are printed in paper, if you listen to old politicians, if you listen to old academics, all the old elite, they will tell you this guy is the underclass. When I started doing my studies, I just decided, let's skip that. That was the old paradigm. It's no longer relevant any more than your family tree was relevant in this era. What if then your interconnectivity can be measured? And what if your interconnectivity decides where you're going to end up in the social arena? And what if this is not an egalitarian society at all? We have to work to get to the egalitarian aspect of it. Actually, it's just fostering a new class society, one between those who are connected and those who are left out. This is when it gets scary. And this is why I feel terribly alone, and only a few new sociologists are with me on this one. Because if I then instead measure interconnectivity, which is how many Twitter followers do you have? How many Facebook friends do you have? Do they actually pay attention to what you do? Just look at something like Instagram. 98% of all pictures uploaded on Instagram are never seen by anybody. Because most of it's just generic crap. It's just like MySpace. Crap music that nobody wants to listen to, where they all pretend they're listening to it, so they can sort of pretend. I pretend I listen to your music, you pretend you listen to my music, and then we write thank you for the ad to each other. And then we tell everybody we're actually lying. Because people are naive, and they lie all the time, and we know it. Because the problem is, very few things that we human beings do is so brilliant, we want to share it. And we're not equally talented at creating things that we want to share with each other. So we're creating a new structure. Yeah. So we're creating a new class structure here. And this is the funny thing. If you measure the interconnectivity, which actually turns out to be really easy, just look at people's cell phones, smartphones, and you look at their laptops, and you look at the communicate with, because everybody's online. What do you discover then? You discover that we have a new digital underclass. And this underclass consists of men who are about 30 years old, still live with their mums in a Swedish or Danish or English small town, because the girls have already moved on to university, and lives there alone, and nobody wants to marry him. He doesn't have a job, because he closed down the military, we closed down the factory, he's got nowhere to go, except sit in front of his computer, jerk off to porn, use the last little pennies he has to be on a casino, an online casino, and then hate. And he hates with a vengeance, and for very good reasons. This is the birth of the modern European extreme right. It now covers between 20 and 30% of the population of the European countries, and it's going to keep growing, because we don't want to see it, because the guy is white, and he's male. And while he's sitting there hating, and nobody sees him except for the extreme right party leaders. 
The Somali cab driver has worked really hard, and he takes his money and goes to his daughter, and she speaks seven languages fluently and has friends in 70 countries. She's already secured a career in the media industry because she's a designer developer. And she doesn't go to the university in Uppsala or Roskilde or Oxford because she goes to Harvard because the European universities aren't good enough for her. She's no longer an underclass. She is the new upper class because she has the most important asset you could possibly find today. A huge address book with the right people in it. So we are not creating an egalitarian society because the internet is creating the society it wants. The same way mass media created the society it wanted. The same way writing created the society it wanted. The same way speech created the society it wanted. The only thing we can now learn to do and we have to do quickly is to learn to adapt to this huge phenomenon and try to tame it. I wrote my first paper on this 17 years ago, basically telling the Swedish government that you should give a computer to every kid in every school. They still haven't 17 years later. They just don't get it. They're bragging about turning off the computers for the kids. He says, why? <laughs> Idiots. Oh, we force our kids to turn off their mobiles during breaks. Why? Don't you think the kids are clever enough to use their mobiles? And the kids who can use the mobiles and connect with people and learn social skills, they're fine. They don't even need the fucking school. Because the school today is nothing but a place for parents to leave their kids so they can go off and do other things. <laughs> it has no other purpose whatsoever. Because we're no longer training factory workers because we don't have the factories. The kids learn far more from Wikipedia on their smartphone than they ever learn from a stupid teacher standing there talking to them. Because it's really the teacher should learn from the students how to use the fucking smartphone. <laughs> History repeating itself. Now, I love this, but I also see the problems ahead of me, and that is why I want to be a political activist. Because I actually believe that we have to go out and find this guy who the extreme right parties has just joined in, and reach to him and say, we want to train you to have more social skills so you can actually stop hating. Not that we're asking or moralizing against your hatred, but actually open you up so you don't have to hate. Because you can learn these social skills. And when you learn these social skills, you can find friends. And when you can find these friends, you can start doing lovely things together. And it's when I looked at this four years ago, I've written three books before about this, but it was actually, I was at Burning Man five years ago. I don't know, we can all critique Burning Man and the Burner movement for you know, all these different side effects or whatever. But the fact was, I knew when I was at Burning Man that this is the future for a very simple reason. That is, if you're 40 years old, the real world is the physical world. IRL, description only used by people over 40 years old. Nobody else uses it. <laughs> Physical world, okay. The, 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 the digital world is something disturbing in your pocket. If you're 20 years old, the digital world is now the real world. And it will remain the real world. Just like you moved from the village to the city during the previous paradigm, we're now moving from the city to the online world. We're creating our identity there. All the important things happen there. We actually don't do anything in the physical world we haven't already decided in the digital world. We didn't meet our partners there. We do everything there. What has then happened to the physical world? It's become a playground. That's exactly what role playing has exploded. That's why we do all these gaming and live things and all these games. We're just ironically playing around with it because we can't afford to, because it's now secondary. But that is the only place we have left where we can meet the guy who's left outside. Because we won't talk to him online. We don't have the time. He's not in our Facebook forum. He's not one of our friends. We're not communicating with him at all. He just hates our guts, and we hate him back and moralize against him. Oh, he's just one of those Sweden Democrats, the stupid idiots, the racists. No, he's left behind. He's left behind. And if we don't feel anything for him, there's something disturbably wrong with us, right? That's where I want to be. Any inputs? <laughs> you want to join me? <laughs> yeah.
I, I want to join you because I, I do have questions, so I cut some, some minutes off the end for you. But I think, so, so much is what I feel in my brain right now, so much, as always, uh, when listening to you. Uh, but, but I think that, well, one thing that's obvious and important is that the world is, of course, not just a playground for a lot of people. I mean, including us, we are still uh, biological beings and we still have these limitations. And, and I think that, but what you're describing is also one of the things that makes us so very ill-equipped to deal with war, uh, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, when war pops up in, a, in contemporary society in countries quite close to us or in countries very much like ours. It's in a way even more shocking because, because the digital world continues. And, and but, but our, I when, while our reality, while our physical example, reality is falling model around. Yeah. It's really easy to understand Islamic State. It all suddenly makes sense. Explain. If you're a guy living in Birmingham and you're left behind and you're jerking off to porn and playing on casino and somebody tells you, if you go to Syria and if you pick up a gun and we pay you for it and you kill somebody who chop his head off and we can put it on YouTube, you get laid. So you go to Syria. It makes sense. You're so fucked up by that time, you don't realize you're killing another human being. Because you hate the world so much anyway, so killing somebody else is just like killing yourself. You've been killed many times over already. That's exactly what Hitler used to in the 1930s in Germany, when people were destitute. That's why it happens. No other model can explain why these phenomena are happening. Right? Islamic State is as much an internet phenomenon as Facebook or Google are. Maybe, I'm um, just thinking... You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're saying sex, uh, that people are only motivated by getting laid. I think that's some kind of, I don't know, Lacanian shorthand it's for... Freud, yeah, it's Freudian, Freudian shorthand yeah, 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 for yeah, yeah, meaning, yeah, yeah. right? Like meaning it. is what we're going yeah, for, Yeah, libido, right? but libido, libido. The want, libido essentially is what makes us want to live. That's what it means. It doesn't mean to get laid, really, but getting laid is the most obvious example of wanting to live. My point here is what I found at Burning Man, and Burning Man now has 100 spin-offs around the world. I should just say that Burning, if somebody doesn't know, Burning Man is a party in the Nevada desert for 50,000 people in a completely empty space that looks like the moon. And they come and they bring and they build a city for 10 days and then they leave and they have an enormous party there for 10 days and then they leave and the desert is entirely untouched. And it is the cultural you have secret to bring everything back. It's a cultural secret behind Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. You do not get anywhere at Google or at Facebook or at Twitter was even invented at Burning Man. So it, it is what makes Silicon Valley unique. Yes, yeah, so sorry, you were saying unique. there are a hundred so offshoots. There are now over a hundred spin-offs of Burning Man. And what I found, I, I speculated on this five years ago, and I was at the Burning Man International Conference this spring. And it turns out there were over representatives from 70 different burns around the world. They had one big problem. They all sold out within two seconds this year. That means we've jumped onto something that everybody else is looking for, the fastest growing social cultural movement on the planet. It's essentially that means an, it an enormous taps into an enormous need. And what I'm preaching here is that this is the need of people like us who are the netocrats. We are the upper class of the digital world. But to me, a burn is the perfect place where I can take a Swedish, Swedish Democrat guy who's 30 years old and introduce him. And in the physical exchange between people, in what's called silent knowledge exchange, I can give him a self-confidence that he will not get online. So That's for, why I'm interested in this culture. But for me, a burn is, I mean, it's um, exactly just as important, but I'm approaching it from the sort of experience design perspective or the analysis stuff that I was talking about this morning. So for me, a burn is, a big ritual yeah. that is co-created by the people inside it, which is, I mean, not entirely. You, you have some frameworks and things, but then the people who go there decide, we're going to create a temporary party, a society, for 10 days, and we're going to have, let's say we're going to have a society with no money at all. At Burning Man, there's no money economy. It's a and gift, no Coca-Cola No sponsors. No, <laughs> no advertising. No. And just that experience for 10 days. And then yeah. we say, and, and it's going to be transformative. Everything we do at, at Burning Man is going to be about creating a transformative experience. Yes. And, and it's, it's a powerful example because it works on a 50,000 people level. Most of us in our day-to-day -day jobs, we get to work with transformative experiences for maybe five people. Mm. There's a question in the back row, and that's going yeah. to be the only question. Yeah, just to finish the Burning Man thing. Don't yes. go to Burning Man and be an individualist. Don't bring your little card. Don't try to self-promote yourself. They will hate you for it. It's mm -hmm. all about collaboration and the beauty of collaboration and participatory culture. That's the point. Mm -hmm. And that is why we have to train these guys to get into them. Yeah, yeah, question.
Can I respond to that? <laughs> Only an etocrat would say that. What, what would the old bourgeoisie have done? The old bourgeoisie bought a big farm in the countryside where they could show, pretend they were aristocrats. Only the upper class says that. If you ask the guy who votes for the extreme right who lives in Normandy in France and votes for Marine Le Pen, he would hate you for saying that. Because in his world, it's obvious that they're two different worlds, but he struggles to get online to comprehend that world. You see what I mean? Yes, uh, and which is also what I was kind of aiming at with the, the real, the physical Why need. Why are you is trying to defend the almost, I'm not saying it's disappeared. <laughs> I'm not saying money has disappeared. I'm just saying we're building another structure on top of the old one. Just like Karl Marx said, Karl Marx was met with the same resistance in the 1840s and people said, factories are not important, cities are not important. All the important things are happening in the countryside. It's all about the church and the king and the aristocracy. But he was right. He only pointed towards what was going to be important in the future. And your identity now comes from your smartphone, your laptop use, whether you like it or not. It's not you who decide that your address book is important. It's other people who force it I'm on gonna you. I'm going to draw a line here because we're going to con continue yeah. this conversation all evening. Good question. Yeah. Good. Sorry? Oh, we have so many questions. Okay, uh, then, we need to, need, uh, then I need to ask. <laughs> okay. Okay, can we... Let's, I'm just looking upstairs. Can we continue for five minutes? Yeah, okay, good. Let's do that. Where's my mic? <laughs> okay, and, and also, I'm gonna, I need to ask you to give, do very short comments. We're going to do you, and you, and you, and then I don't know if we have time for more. Okay. Go. There, there it goes. Um, uh, I would join in here too. Um, there is some inconsistency if you then are so kind of ecstatic about the Burning Man and putting yourself in there as a teacher, trying to then, in, in best case, take the whole kind of right-wing underclass uh, and put them into Burning Man and show them that there is another kind of meaning. We need physical interaction. We probably need Burning teachers Man is much more. Interaction. Yeah, but yeah. how do we get that happen? So we, we and the connection with the digital world is so close that we could do things there too and be also an example for those reaching out for those who probably then are neglected. Mm -hmm. And there it starts to be physical again. You can you can do this online but you have to go there as well and kind of embrace them somehow so are that you doing that? Are you yes. doing that? How? Yes. Yes. Let well, me know you, because I'll write about it. I'd love okay. any example I next, can get that next, reaches next. out. Next one. Yeah, okay. Uh, we let's agree. do it here, front row. Yep. Uh, Eric. <laughs> Behind you. Oh, okay. No, yes. no, go ahead. Oops. Is it on? Okay. So, on the net today, compared to like 15 years ago, we have apps, we have Facebook, Twitters, we have the like multi corporations and the nation states who control quite a large space of that which would be like the Napoleons of the internet in some way, sense, or shape. How would you see the sort of uh, recreation of the old power structures in the net context and us being a part of that? Well, the old power structure, including the Catholic Church, the aristocracy and the kings, did have quite a lot of power for an extensive time during the old paradigm, and eventually they lost out. The reason they lost out because they could not communicate successfully in the new mode. Okay, the old structures like the nation state is terrible at collaboration and participatory culture. It's just good at telling you what to do and forcing you to do it and throwing the police after you. Now all you need to do is to go to the dark net and you can order a murder and the Swedish police can do nothing about it. Don't case do solved. Don't case, do no, that. don't do it, but case closed. Mm. Case closed. Okay. You see what I mean? Yeah. Um, have you invited uh, one of these right-wing extremists to join you? Uh, at, uh, or a more generic question, how would you invite them? And what if they say no? Uh, Eric, throw the microphone back. Yeah. Go. Go. Um, I'm one of the few leftist activists in Sweden who have dinners with the Sweden Democrats to begin with because I happen to believe in dialogues. I try to practice what I preach, which brings you on to your important question. I don't, I don't, we shouldn't moralize. If people ever give anything, it, charity or whatever, it's because they have an abundance of something. If I ever do anything good, it's because I have an abundance of something. And I happen to believe that I can actually accumulate with the dialogue because I'm not a political candidate. That's all there's to That's why I refuse to be a politician myself. I think I could do more by not being a politician. 
at this stage, because I think dialogue is the only thing we have. For a non-politician, you belong to a lot of political parties and been very visible in a bunch of them. I, I was I'm, a pirate all along, anyway. I was just an advisor. That's what you always <laughs> say when you switch parties. Last question, please. <laughs> There's yeah. so many points I would bring up, but the first one is I think that we agree that history is perception. That's the only thing that history actually is. It's a common perception that we've agreed on. And it's interesting that you build your argument on this cyclical nature starting from our history went from purely oral history, then we get writing, and then et cetera. We also agree that information is currency, and those that hold the information have the power. Mm -hmm. And given the way that you, you built up your argument, we're now at this digital age where just everyone has a narrative. And it's all bullshit, because we're, back, we're almost back to that place where it's an oral history, but there's no content anymore. It's just stuff, it's just noise, it's just words. There's no way to, on the internet, there's no way to find out who's actually right, who's true. If I could say anything, and it could just people pick it up, and hey, it's a truth. No. Yes. I, I, I have a quality filter, and I use maybe not, maybe not you. For that but that's filter. not what I'm trying but to get to. There okay. is an it's, aspect where, where it's harder to. I mean, for instance, big corporations. It is very difficult to be a hypocrite and don't get and to not get caught out. I mean, because but you can get called out. What I'm trying to say is that we agree. Truth is only what we currently agree on. And what I'm trying to say is, with the the increase of hyperconnectivity and the, the information is is no longer just stuff. Like that's content. If information is actual, those gems that you really want to share that are worthwhile, isn't it true that we then end up at the back at the bottom of that cycle that you just described? Okay. Okay. History? She gave me 35 minutes. In all fairness, simplification is not my problem. Right. 35, did, you think, did you think I could put four thick books into 35 minutes of a speech? <laughs> you're not fair to me. <laughs> what, no what, fair. what you're pointing out is the biggest value available in a chaotic society, curatorship. And even in the first book, there's a whole fucking chapter on curatorship. That means the biggest value is no longer in the production. It's actually in sorting the information and pointing us in the right direction. Did you just the way, the way we in the digital age? No, the digital age, that's more important than ever. That means production is no longer important. What's important is to point us in the right direction. And we do that by repeating the same thing. That's exactly why every fucking hotel chain on the planet is a scared shitless of TripAdvisor. That's, that's exactly what Lisa talked about before. Corporate social responsibility has not happened because companies want to be nice. <laughs> it has happened because the people they want to employ, which is us, say, if you don't have a CSR policy, I'm not even listening to you. Mm -hmm. That is a force coming from the internet. The internet is forcing us towards more truth or at least the intention towards truth. Because we so quickly discover now who's bullshitting us that we're just skipping the guys to bullshitting us and going with those who at least so far have shown an intention towards truth. Or are the loudest, but it, over yeah. time. Over time, over time, you know, big a, picture now. Big picture centuries yes. then, yes. okay. So I'm gonna try and ask a last question again, <laughs> which, which is, I, I am a big believer in, I think the truth, which is that, that that a lot of the internet technology that certainly even to my generation, even though I was an early adopter, uh, st still feels like a special thing, like a special category, and I still think IRL. Um, that's going to become just infrastructure now. We're going to think very soon, within three years probably, even a lot of quite ordinary people will think about internet as much as they think about highways and like water mains. Yeah. Um, and one of the effects of this is that all, everything that we're doing is really important because the questions aren't going to be so much about what is the correct interface. It's going to be about like, what do people actually want to do with each other? What do they want to see? And one of the things that people do want to do is to be in a physical presence. The value yeah. of that has completely changed. Yeah. Can you say something about that at the very end to tie up this day? Because we've been talking so much also about place. That is exactly why I became so interested in participatory culture. And, and, and that is the physical meeting. Because physical meetings are also becoming incredibly expensive because we put them in relation to how much we live in the digital world. We lived zero minutes a day in the digital world 40 years ago. We now have six and a half hours a day in the digital world. Now moving towards seven hours. That's more than we sleep. And there's no sign whatsoever that's going to increase, in decrease, it's going to increase even more. Mm -hmm. That means the physical meeting becomes a rarity, and this is simple economics. Whatever is rare and still has value to people become even more worth, and you have a higher worth. And that is exactly why we want our physical meetings to be quality. 
We don't just go to cocktail parties anymore and talk to people we don't want to know. No, we're all going, oh, I'm not going to do this unless I meet really interesting people who I can really get engaged with so we can have incredible network dynamical effects of our meetings. Enter participatory culture. And that's what we're going to do. And the question is, can we drag people along? Because that's the exactly what we're going to learn to be even better at what we do and we're already ahead of the game. So I, I want to drag these other guys along. That's what I want to do. So, so I asked Alexander why he agreed to come here, even though, of course, I'm, I'm very happy that he did. And he said, oh, of course, it's totally interesting, super cool. Like, what you're doing here goes straight into my interesting participatory culture. But really, I mean it for the dinner, because I think we're going to yeah. have some really yeah. interesting yeah. conversations. Yeah. yeah, dinner tonight. Yeah. 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 That's why I'm here. Alexander Bard. Yeah.